traditional lands and territories of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, uh, so, uh, Laura Forsyth, Dishon Kushan, um, Rooster Town, Ostchim, uh, Niwikan, uh, Winnipeg, Nia uh, Michif. So I'm Michif. I'm AT from uh, Winnipeg. I'm currently living in Winnipeg. My family lived in Rooster Town, but now Winnipeg is swallowed up Rooster Town, so we now live here. Uh, and uh, I'm learning how to speak Michif, so I try to use it any place and space I can. Um, so welcome to the day. Uh, at this time, I would like to do something impromptu that wasn't in the notes, and we're going to. In Nikita, it's okay, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to introduce uh, our new. Uh, Resident Elder, she is going to be here full time Monday to Friday, and I would love all of you to meet her and <coughs> come and see her. So I'd like to introduce uh, Wanda Murdoch to come up and have a few words. sharing with our um, other elders that are here and my journey is a spiritual journey. Um, it took me many years praying, you know, and um, giving myself to, to help our young people. Uh, I worked as uh, in the health group for 21 years. I was a community wellness worker. I worked with diabetes, our elders. I attended uh, dialysis units over the years and understand that our sick children are illness that are, are people that have, that have uh, working with um, uh, many, many elders that have passed on over the years, understanding the wellness and illness that we uh, can get. We were just sharing this morning uh, some of the things that we go through uh, when going to school, uh, the stress that uh, can come upon us. So what I do over the working with students, you know, I um, uh, I do have a, a fan, and I work more with medicine. So I need to come share with me. You know, I'll be here from Monday through Friday, eight to four thirty. And um, I thank Creator for giving me the knowledge that I had accumulated over the years. And it's taken me 30 years to get where I am today. And I shared with a young man the other day that, you know, if there's certain times uh, we want things, it's not going to come uh, tomorrow or maybe next week or two months from now. It may take years. And um, so that's the knowledge I would like. I also work with uh, women, uh, Sherry Circles. Uh, I do sing, I carry a drum. And I just wanted to um, introduce myself and, you know, welcome to come and see me whenever you want. So we will see. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Unsettling ideas, we'll get started on our program. It's <laughs> intended to engage students, staff, faculty, and community in discussions around anti-racism, decolonization, and uh, reconciliation. And I see just across the room here today that we're actually accomplishing that. So I thank all of you uh, for being here from the various levels and places you are on the campus. Uh, to get started in this book club. And the book club originated, uh, launched in uh, 2016 in Regina, in Territory 4, and now is expanding to Winnipeg uh, Territory 1, ter uh, Tree, Tree 1 Territory, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So all titles of the book club will be authored or edited by Indigenous writers, thinkers, and academics. And it's with good intention that we ensure this meeting is hosted at the Fort Gary campus event, but as well in the community this evening. Uh, it will be uh, located at the William Norrie Center uh, from 7 to 8.30. So if you don't get enough today, certainly, you know, come with us tonight over at 485 Selkirk Avenue uh, with some tea and some bannock. You're all welcome to join us. So this afternoon's uh, program is going to be, number one, we will invite the author, mm -hmm. Chelsea Mello is going to come up. 
to speak with you about her book for about 45 minutes. That's why I say if you don't get enough, come tonight. Uh, we will also then uh, turn over the floor to you to have any questions that you have around the book or around some of the work that Chelsea's done. And then at 12.45, we're going to wrap up with a lunch, uh, and you'll be encouraged to have your further discussions with one another and your thoughts about the book. Uh, note, a uh, little housekeeping, that if anyone would like to use the general um, inclusive bathroom, it's right through this door on the left, along with the other washrooms. And uh, we're going to be live streaming this on Facebook. Uh, so if you want to show some friends, or you want to share it later today, uh, or just see it again, uh, you can go to the Indigenous Student Center's uh, Facebook page, and it will be available to you. So the first selection, so Miltem Chelsea Vowell. I really like Chelsea Vowell. That's a little more mature for you. And I'm really excited that the first selection uh, of Unsettling Ideas was Chelsea Vowell's Indigenous Rights, A Guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Issues in Canada from the High Road Press. I want every single undergrad student in this campus to read this book after I was reading it. I was so pumped. Um, so in 31 essays, Chelsea explores the Indigenous experience from the time of contact present through five categories terminology of relationships, culture and identity, myth-busting, state violence, and land learning law and treaties. She answers the questions that many people have on these topics to spark further conversations at home, in the classroom, and in the larger community. So I'm excited to see her today. So we are honored to have her here with us uh, today on campus. Chelsea Bawa is Métis from Manitou Saka again, uh, Laksenyan, Alberta, residing in uh, Miss Kowalski again, Edmonton. Uh, that's a hard one, everyone. Um, so, mother to six girls. She has a B ed and an LLB, and she is currently a graduate student and a Cree language instructor at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. This is why you're all here, because she is amazing. Uh, Chelsea is a public intellectual, writer, educator who intersects language, gender, Metis self determination, and resurgence. She is a co host of Indigenous Feminist Sci-Fi Podcast, Métis in Space, and Chelsea blogs on Apita Wigosian and makes legendary bannock. So please welcome Chelsea Bach. Ewa uh open su school mania po uh up kita gosisan school mania. Um digo to asik nito tansen, ewa kagige e ni parhe nesto sian. Uh so just giving you some of the same information that you had uh from Lax A Tan, which is just west of Edmonton. And uh because of those aforementioned six daughters, I am always very tired. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always I always say this because you know I always expect that at some point I might just doze off or fall down. Uh, but I'm always I'm always speaking through this haze of like constant exhaustion, um, and I often feel like I'm just rambling. You know, like you know uh, Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. and somehow you hear words, real words, uh, and and that always amazes me. So. Um, I am thankful that you were here to hear words. Uh, <laughs> so, when have I ever not been exhausted? I don't know. I, I honestly don't remember. So, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, why I wrote the book, how I wrote the book, how the book came about, because it's a weird experience. This is my first... I never... Okay. Honestly, I always wanted to be a writer when I was younger, but uh, I wanted to like, write fiction. You know, like I, I was never going to write boring stuff. Uh, and... And, and so I never, you know, I still feel like I'm not a writer because I haven't published, you know, like some like really hardcore science fiction yet, but I'm on the way. I'll tell you about that later. So, uh, yeah, this, this was a bit of an accident. I, uh, as I explained, I, I explained some of this in the introduction, but really, really downplayed a little bit of it. So, um, I, I procrasto inspirate a lot. That means like I avoid deadlines and work by taking on often wildly implausible projects. Um, in bursts of, of, of inspiration. And uh, so a lot of what I was doing online back in 2011 was uh, arguing with people on the internet, you know, <laughs> instead of doing <laughs> more important things. Although I was like, this is important too. I, I need to go and tell these people why they're wrong and how they're wrong. Um, and back, back in 2011, sort of like as I have a memoir was starting, um, it was interesting because this was this was before everybody had sort of shut down their comment sections. So comment sections were just like the wild west. It was just like anything goes. And so um, somebody would report uh, 
anything having to do with indigenous peoples. It could like it could literally be, you know, a man stabs in the corner and beats a drum. There's the story. And then underneath the story would be a bunch of people commenting about how, oh yeah, well, he doesn't pay taxes and he's got a free house and he gets free education and you know, and how come he's got it so good? I've got it so bad. And so I would go and you know, it's hard, you're like, pick which which stereotype are you gonna address today? Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many, you know? You're you're like, here's here's the topic, here's the real topic, and then branching off from there are all these assumptions, these beliefs that people have. Um, and really, really believe that they know. So it, it, it's interesting because we live in these this sort of um, in these solitudes. They talk about the two solitudes in Canada, and they talk they mean the French and the English. But really, like, how many people know nothing at all about Indigenous folks? Like, nothing. But they think they do. They think they know everything about us. So I would go. I would go into the comment sections. I would be like, well, actually, uh, Indigenous peoples do pay taxes. And I would, I, so I would go and I would find sources, you know, because nobody, nobody believes what you say. I, you have to back yourself up. Um, and I was in, I was in law school at the time, so I was, you know, the sky is blue. Back it up, source. I was really used to that. So I was like, boom, 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 boom. And I was like, I just did a good job. Pat, pat, pat. And then I would see Joe Blow, racist 201, uh, who had just schooled, go on to another article, make the same claim, and I was like, oh, I just explained that to you, <laughs> like not two seconds ago. Uh, I know you read it, and uh, so I was really, I was, I was annoyed by that. I was like, hmm, it's almost as if some of these people aren't actually wanting to learn, huh? But then, like Jane Doe, twenty-one, would be, oh, you know, this is really interesting. I was reading your exchange, and now I know that Indigenous peoples do pay taxes. Thank you for that. I was like, I'm not actually talking to Joe Blow Racist 21. I'm actually talking to Jane Doe 21. So that was that was interesting. Um, I realized how many people were just sort of spectators in these conversations and how much you can influence them. Um, and so I decided that I was tired of, of uh, spending so much time arguing with these people, uh, you know, in comment sections and all my work getting lost. So I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this into a blog post so that every time I see the same guy making the argument, I'm just going to go, link, there's the blog post. And I know he's not going to read it because he didn't read it the first time, but other people will be like, hmm, click on that and be like, aha, interesting, you know? So uh, for me, it was a labor-saving device is I would, I would write these blog posts with all of the information. Don't believe me. Like, I'm, here's the argument I make. Here are the claims I make. Here are the sources that I use to, to back up my claims. Um, go ahead and check them out and see if I'm full of it. See if there's anything you want to argue with there. Of course, rarely does anybody actually do that. They just, most people just read the, the, the title, um, a bit of the argument, and then they're like, but, but this. And I'm like, I'm not gonna argue that. I, I read the article. I literally address that like, later. Um, so my first, my first article was about Attawapiskat because at the time Stephen Harper was going on about how Attawapiskat had received $90 million of federal funds and how is it that they're still so miserable and things aren't perfect and, we give them all the money in the world. You know, he, he led Canada to believe that um, people were squandering the money uh, or were, uh, you know, um, not ha not thankful enough for the money or, you know, we, we keep throwing money at Native people and it doesn't solve the problems. Well, yes, obviously that's true. Money does not solve the problem. But I wanted to take a look and break down that, that money and see how much is that really? Because this is, you know, you saying this was for housing and whatnot. So I thought I would I would do a little bit of math, and I'm not great at math, so you know it was very it was very uh, I really went through it um, to figure out you know is is that actually a lot of money for housing in the north? Spoiler alert, it is not a lot of money, um, and I just and I just broke that down like and and I thought you know anybody can do this like when somebody makes a claim like this, and if you actually are interested, if you're if you're like yeah, why when they get so much money are things still not perfect? You know, go and find out for yourself. It's not that difficult. Um, so I put that I put that out there, and uh, and it went viral, and so okay. So here's the thing too. I'm not a good example, um, uh, but that procrastinate inspiration that I was talking about. So I, I wrote I wrote this article. I went to that, and the next day I had a I had a final exam in law, uh, in French, um, and and I woke up and there were like a bazillion notifications. Like before this, my blog was a geeky little language blog that not even my mother read. You know, <laughs> I'd get like 100 hits in a month and I'd be like, woo, you know? And it was like, I got, I got something like 10,000 hits. And I was like, what? And there were just comments pouring in 
Um, most of them positive, most of them like, wow, like, but what about this and tell me about that? So I just sat down with my tea and I was like responding, responding, and before I knew it, I missed my exam. I, like I, eight hours, I just sat there. Like it was just, it was, it was the weirdest thing. And I felt like, I felt like, um, I felt like it was really important to respond it now, you know, because like, people's attention span is really short, right? And and they want to know. And so you know, so I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm like, oh gosh, I just I missed my exam. And the next day I had another one, and I'm like, well, you, you know when you like skip a day. Uh, you're like, I'm not going to skip. I'm not going to skip. And then you skip one day and all of a sudden you're skipping everything. Yeah. That's me. It's, it's, it's bad. I'm, I'm terrible. It's like I have, I, I have to be perfect. I make one mistake and then I, just everything hangs loose. So I just like dropped out. I didn't do any of my final exams. But it's great because it turns out I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, so all that to say it was all as it was meant to be. This was not a mistake. This was, this was how it was meant to be. And, uh, and then after that, you know, I, I realized that people were using this, Native and non-Native people were using this article um, to, to make the arguments that they didn't want to make anymore. Because it's exhausting to constantly have to um, humanize yourself, um, justify your existence. Somebody says, what about this? And you answer that and they're like, yeah, but what about this, 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 and this? And you're like, I can't okay. talk about all of that. It's unreasonable for you to expect me to give you like 500 years of history for you to get this and you don't really want it. You don't really want to know that information. Why am I, why am I going to put in that effort? And so folks were using this article and saying, like, look at this. You keep talking about Adamopiscat like you care. Look at this. And so I, I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll do more of that because I'm very exhausted. I'd already been having these discussions for like 15 years, and I was like, this is a great way to write it down. You know, really, really back myself up and never speak about it again. <laughs> and now. All I do is speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, I had a series of essays up there that people were finding useful, and I had a whole bunch of people, um, you know, telling me like, put it in a book, put it in a book, and I'm like, with what time? <laughs> like, when am I going to do this? Um, and so here's another uh, another thing that motivates me. I walked into chapters, picked up a new book that was about indigenous topics. I was like, cool, flipping through it, and then this wave of familiarity washed over me. I was like, this sounds like my work. And there was like a full paragraph that I was like, wait, I could have sworn I wrote that. And I and I checked on like on my phone, I'm like, oh my head, I'm checking my blog, and I'm like, well, it's a little bit different, but that's basically what I said. And I and I showed it to my husband, I'm like, oh my goodness, like this person published my stuff basically. And, and he's like, he's like, yeah, what are you gonna do about it? And I was like, I'm gonna publish my own book. <laughs> <laughs> I just had my baby. And so I, I had an unpaid mat leave, um, and so I sat there for three months and just like wrote the book for an hour or two every day while I'm dealing with this baby in that haze of exhaustion that has never lifted, and got it done. So sometimes anger can be really productive. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and then I was like, uh, so the publishing process was, was new to me. Um, I figured, you know, I write it, that's it. No, no. There were edits and there were, you know, like, it was so much work. It was like a year beyond that of, of uh, constantly going back and I'm so tired of the material. I was like, hey, does I never want to see it again. Um, you know, and picking out images and stuff like that, just doing all the, it, it was, it was a really, it's a really intense process. Um, also, uh, you're never going to get rich. You make like no money. Everyone's like, oh, um, you're an author. Like, Mostly family. You're an author. Like you're buying, you're buying supper. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got <have> six daughters. <laughs> but it's like I don't really make a lot of money off it, and that's fine. That's not why I did it. Uh, but just be aware, you know, because these are things I didn't know. You know, you all kind of assume about authors and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I was, it was so I was so naive, um, and so it was it was interesting because uh, I made I made each of these chapters deliberately. Very short. Um, I, I think that the putting all these footnotes in there, that's for people to learn more. You know, like I hope that you're, you you should be able to just flip to any point, to any topic, and be like, you know, I don't want to learn about all this stuff, but right now I want to learn about this one thing. I want to learn about housing. And so you just read that by itself, and you don't have to read the rest of the book to understand it. And then when you want more information, all those footnotes are there to guide you. Um, and sometimes I put little funny things in there and I always wait to see if people ever notice my little jokes. Um, you know, and then the idea is you print it off and you take it to your racist, um, you know, uncle at Thanksgiving who's always going off about, like, those natives and they always get free houses and you're just like, 
Here you go. You can protect yourself on that. <laughs> and it has been taken up in that way, um, which is like constantly amazing to me. But um, as I said, you know, I sort of I had this again naive assumption that I would I would put this out into the world, and everybody would be caught up on on all of this stuff. And as a country, we would we would be able to like move into more interesting conversations about what we're going to do in the future. Uh, that is not the case, uh, but I, I do feel like you know enough people are are reading it and discussing it that you know there's there's little ripples of that happening, and I just really want native people in particular to not have to do this work all the time. You know, like it's you, you don't have to keep saying well whatever you think. Even if I didn't pay taxes, uh, even if I got everything for free, I'm still a human being. Like I, I'm still somebody who. Um, merits care and love and attention. Um, you know that should that should be obvious. We shouldn't always have to like humanize ourselves. And so if this if this saves people a little bit of um, time and energy that they can be spending doing uh, more interesting things, more creative things, more generative things, then that's that's what I want to happen. Uh, how am I for time? Pretty good. Okay. Um, what else can I say about this? Uh, let's let, let's talk about what I want to do when when everybody just absorbs this into their brains and knows everything for real about Native people. So um, what I'm working on right now, I'm a grad student at the Faculty of Native Studies, and I'm focusing on Métis futurisms, which sounds like ooh, you know. Um, I tried to define it last night at a panel, and uh, and realized like it, I, I wasn't doing a very good job, and, and it's so it's sort of this thing that you do where you're like see things through a Métis lens and you talk about the past and the present and the future and you're trying to make a better world and yeah I don't I don't really know how to define it it's just it's it's uh I want to be able to think about uh what life could be like if everything was awesome you know that like that that, that annoying Lego song yeah, everything's awesome um you know everything's Cool all the time. I'm just gonna sing the whole song. Uh, you know, what if, what if, what if we got every, what if we got everything we wanted? What if everything really was great and we weren't confined to a scarcity model and we weren't afraid of one another and we actually embodied Wakutuin, this expanded kinship where we respect one another as human beings through um, a lens of reciprocity and relationality. We respect our non-human kin. We live on this earth sustainably. What if we, what if we were able to do that again? Right? What would, what would that look like um, in a landscape that has been very much changed by, you know, white supremacy and settler colonialism? I like to think about, for example, if the, if the buffalo were all to come back suddenly, you know, like some sort of time rift. They just millions upon millions of buffalo tearing through fences, you know, knocking over barns, um, tearing up the, the, the invasive grasses that. Have root systems that only go down a few inches, you know. Bringing back those um, those burrowing owls uh, that like that like buffalo dung to, to put their nests in, and cow dung just doesn't do the trick. What would what would the landscape look like after a decade of that? How would it how would it change? Would it look like what our ancestors saw? Would it be different? Would new new species sort of take root with climate change? Who knows? Um, you know, maybe maybe it goes back to the way it was. Maybe it becomes something new. What would it be like if uh, if Canada hadn't been able to expand west? If if we'd won, you know, uh, what if what if a two spirit Ruburu trampled Johnny McDonald to death when she transformed into a horse, <laughs> and then this was still Mekiaqua territory, and we had those those strong political alliances with one another again? What would what would things look like? You know, I like I like to think about that, and I think we need to think about that, um, all of us living in Canada, because. You know, I, I often talk about this as though, I'm, I'm always asked to speak about indigenous issues, you know? But these are not indigenous issues, these are Canadian issues. Like, this is not indigenous history, this is Canadian history. So how is it that Canadians um, are so forgetful of that history? How come Canadians could create, and it's not just Canadians, I any mean, colonizers, how could you create something like a concept like blood quantum, when you're, when you're measuring people uh, people's indigeneity. How can you create something like that, enforce it, and then forget what it is, and act all surprised when we're like, hey, blood quantum sucks. What is that? Well, you made it up. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? Um, you know, Canada, Canada has this history. Canada only exists because of this history, their history, your history, our history. Um, why is it that Canadians can go around and just not know about it? 
you know, what, what, it, what does that forgetting do? Um, and I want to undo that forgetting, and I want to create, I want to create memories um, that are based in, in truth. I think a lot of people believe that what I do is propagandist and revisionist, mm -hmm. you know, when I talk about mm -hmm. the actual history, because people don't want to hear that John A. McDonald sucked, mm -hmm. you know? People don't want to hear about his racism. They're like, well, that was a different time. Well, yeah, it was a different time, but even in his time, people were like, wow, you are extraordinarily racist, <laughs> you know? People were always, always uh, pointing these things out. And, and when people make those claims, well, it was a different time. That was acceptable then. To whom? At no point were indigenous peoples like, yeah, I'm cool with that. That's fine. At no point were black people like, yeah, don't let us into Canada. I love that. At no point were like, Chinese people were like, yeah, don't let me bring my family. That is the best. Thanks. It's a different time, so I like it. No, that, that's not reality. So always um, one, one version of history is privileged. And I think, I think that that forgetting is a violence, not just for um, black and indigenous and people of color, it's a violence for all Canadians. Because if you don't know where you're from, if you don't actually know your own history, how do you know where you're going? Like, how, like honestly, like, how can you make decisions about the future if you have deliberately repressed and forgotten the past and, and you don't know what's worked before and what hasn't worked? Like, how are you gonna make those choices? You can't, you can't make informed choices. So, you know, we, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country, and we're still not even, a, you know, a fraction of the way through the truth-telling. There's so many truths that still need to be uncovered, so many truths that are considered to be sort of conspiracy theory or exaggerated. When, you know, when families and communities were first trying to bring up the issue of murdered missing Indigenous women, folks were like, no, that's, that's ridiculous, that's not really happening, and it's not as bad as you think it is. And, there was a lot of gaslighting going on, and people had to really, really push and be like, this is actually a thing. When people were talking about um, those cemeteries at residential schools, conspiracy theory, that would never happen, you know? You have to push through so much gaslighting to, to actually get people to be like, yes, it's a thing. Like, let's, we have to, we have to talk about these things. They're uncomfortable, and they're terrible, um, and they're soul-wrenching, but we have to talk about these things. Um, and this is, you know, I have to get asked too, is, I, I got asked actually very aggressively the other day, well, do you just blame white people for everything? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to be like, no, not all white people. But I mean, like, can you blame an individual for institutional and systemic, um, you know, racism? Can you, can you blame a person for not knowing history when it's deliberately not taught to them? Kind of, a little bit, you know? Like, at the point, there's a responsibility. Once you know that there's a lack there, there's a responsibility to go out and, and change it. But obviously, an individual can't change it themselves. So, you know, it's not about individual guilt. It's not about you are a bad person because your ancestors did something. No, it's, it's about, like, a collective responsibility. And it always has been. And we cannot change anything if we're not going to make institutional changes. We talk about indi indigenization. Indigenize all the things. Decolonize all the things. I'm gonna decolonize like my, my tea. My tea is now decolonized. What does that even mean? Like, that's not even a thing. <laughs> if, if decolonization, indigenization requires systemic change, like not just inclusion, we cannot just be put into spaces if the spaces remain the same. I have a really terrible metaphor that I love to use all the time, because it's so ridiculous. Um, at one point, one of my daughters to pick at me, you know how teenagers love to just oh, like yeah. rebel against their parents. Was like, I'm gonna be, a, I'm, I'm gonna be a cop when I get older. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I have failed this child. And she says, What? Do you think I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna become racist and violent because I'm a cop? And I was like, How do I respond to this? You know, because she was just goading me, right? And I was like, Being a cop, it's, it's like, think of a bathtub, okay? You can fill it up with cold water or warm water, and let's say the warm water are the good cops and the cold water is the bad cops. Um, in the end, it's still a bathtub, and she was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> And what I really should have said is like, it's, it's the system. The individuals um, can come and go and make changes, incremental or not. You can, you can bust open some, some space. Uh, that is very important work. We need folks to do that, to bust open space in these institutions that want to exclude us. I would never say stop doing that because it's so, so necessary and it's paved the way for where, you know, like I'm a first generation um, university student. If, if people hadn't done that work, I wouldn't be where I am. 
But this, if, 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 if we're always just looking at the individual, and we don't look at collective responsibility, then we don't see, you know, we don't see the way that the institutions sort of um, box you in and force you to behave in certain ways. I mean, this is simple stuff. This, this should be obvious. But I constantly have to tell people, it's not about assigning um, individual guilt to anybody. This is all about collective responsibility, and it's not on Indigenous peoples to constantly build those bridges and be the educators, because generation after generation, the generosity and love of Indigenous peoples who reach out and try to tell our stories, um, I, it, 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 we do it, we do the work, and it is, it is so much work. Um, and often it's received with polite applause and a few thank yous and some speeches, and then all of that information is shelved and left and just forgotten again. You know, stop making us do that. Like, we've, we've done it. And, and we'll still do it if, if you just meet us there and, and make some changes. So I kind of want to finish with that is, you know, this book is meant to be a beginning. It's meant to be a place where you start. Um, I never ever wanted it to be a place where people would stop and think that they knew enough now. Because this is, this, this should make you, this should, if, if you read this book and you don't have a million questions, at the end of it, go back and read it again. It should, it should just make you question everything. Um, and then you go and you find out, and you talk to people and, and you keep questioning. And that's what we really, really need to do. Um, at no point is this battle ever going to be won. At no point are we going to be able to rest on our laurels and say we've accomplished this and we've accomplished that because it's going to be clawed back as it is in every generation. And every single generation is going to have to use new tactics. Um, and you can't do that if you don't know what's been tried before. So know your history. It's all of our history. Um, and start behaving you know, in a way that uh, is relational instead of transactional. Uh, we're not here to be extracted. We're here to be your kin. Hi, hi, Mr. Hanson. Uh, there is no microphone, so please just try to project the best that you can. Uh, She's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> section, yeah. What section did you find the most challenging to write of the book? Okay, but what, what section did I find the most challenging to write of the book? Um, the, the chapter on residential schools. I knew I couldn't um, not put it in there, but um, I... Especially once I had kids. So, okay, so here's the thing is, um, you know, in, in, the, in the 80s, um, folks in community began to start opening up about their residential school experiences. We, you know, folks were not talking about it um, very much before, for all sorts of obvious reasons. And it was, it was odd, you'd be at a community meeting and somebody would stand up and, and be like, I was, at, I was at residential school and this, this and this happened and then and then talk about what they were going to talk about something totally unrelated, and it was always like, oh my gosh, like it was just this thing, right? Like you're like unprepared for it. Um, and it was very important that people were, were going through that process. Um, and so by the time that the TRC came out, I'd already heard a lot of these stories, and it's, it's terrible, it's, 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 it's very, very difficult to hear. And, and then when I had my own kids, I was like, I can't hear these stories. Um, it's too... Like, I, it, you know, I want to honor these people's truth and their experiences, but, like, I, I can't help but look at my kids and think, like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm skirting around this even now. I cannot talk directly about this um, in public because I'll just bawl, and that's not useful. So I knew I had to write this chapter, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it the same way that I had. I really deeply engaged with the material and everything else, but here I was like, uh, read this, read that, here are facts. You know, because I cannot handle it. And that, um, that, that uh, poem that, that starts it, Monster, um, I put a link in there. I really, really highly recommend that you go, the, the, uh, the poet actually, uh, you can, there's a YouTube video, you can hear the entire poem, is devastating. <sighs> so, sometimes, you know, they tell you that you're gonna get sort of like emotional calluses. And some, you know, for some things you do, you're like, yeah, whatever, I can, I can deal with it. That one, it never, there's no callus, it just gets a broader. Sorry. 
Sorry, that was a bit of a downer, but yeah. Uh, we honor tears as medicine. <laughs> yes. Tears are medicine. All right. Anyway, sorry, next. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the education section, you talked a little bit about people saying, oh, well, I get Indigenous history in K-12, to which you clearly, you know, outlined no. Yeah. So what should that education actually look like? All right. So, uh, so my... I, I consider myself above everything like a teacher because I, I keep going back to that. I keep coming back to the academy like like it's some sort of like self flagellation because I hate it. Uh, but I love teaching. Every time I go back to the you know I teach high school and I just oh god I love I love teaching. Um, so I you know I have, I have two answers to that. We need um, we need like total reform in K to twelve uh, curriculum. And this is the thing like in Alberta uh, in Manitoba is doing a, a pretty decent job <coughs> uh, with teacher training too, but. In Alberta, we just underwent uh, like a curricular reform. Mm -hmm. Folks were working to integrate Indigenous issues across all topics, all courses, K to 12, and then a new government got in, and it was all kiboshed. All that work just done, right? And we see this in Quebec too. They were um, they came out with this uh, horrific uh, new social studies book that just completely erased Indigenous peoples. There was a lot of outcry. Then they redid it. And then they're going back again. Like it's, it, it's we're sort of at the at the mercy of a, a political mm -hmm. sort of whim. But that's not enough. Even if we got the total curricular reform, it's not enough because those schools, again, it's the structures. Mm -hmm. Those schools are anti-indigenous. Those schools are like anti everybody. Like it's a 19th century banking system of education that doesn't work for most people. Most people who go to those schools like um, are not you know, being treated with the, the love and care uh, and respect that they deserve. And, you know, you have to you have to learn in one particular way to kind of, like, do okay. Uh, you know, we talk about kinesthetic learning and this and that, but, like, we try to integrate it, but the, the system doesn't really let us do it properly. It's not how education works. I would like to see, uh, you know, multi-generational multi education where you've got, you know, um, you got older siblings who are displaying their mastery by helping their younger siblings just like in reality in everyday life where you've got elders there where you've got um, natural education happening you know um, and I we can't do it we can't do it with this system of education and so I, I do say it doesn't work for anybody it's not just indigenous peoples I think we we know this there's reams and reams of policy papers about how we have to change the educational system but we don't get around to it so um, that's what I want to see. It's not, it's not enough to put some topics in. We need to fundamentally change how we go about educating. And we have to really think about why are we doing this, you know? And ultimately, you know, uh, it's pretty clear over the years that it, it's, it's an economic thing. We're training people for the workforce. Is that really what we want to do? Capitalism sucks, man. Let's not just keep, like, churning out workers. Like, you have to be obedient and you have to be able to put up with abuse. And you have to deal with people who are arbitrary. Um, because that's the real life in, in, in you know, out when you get to work. And that's true. And God, doesn't that suck? Like, you have to, like, you have to put up with abuse. Because you're going to have to put up with abuse in the in the job force. That's what we're training people to do. Yeah. We can do better than that. So, tear it all down. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Chelsea, for your wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, the, the thing about taxes. Uh, it's in the Indian Act for First Nations only pay taxes. Uh, what, is there any more that you could speak to that? Because mm -hmm. since I've been living in the city for 20 years, I pay every tax there is pay. Yeah, oh absolutely. And that's the thing is there's so many hidden taxes too. Right, there's, there's you got in income tax, sales tax, you know, federal, provincial taxes. But um, what a lot of people fail to, to recognize is, you know, there's there's also environmental taxes and stuff that are already that are put into the, the price of things and for good reason, like to you know to uh, to fund programs that taxes are supposed to do, right? Um, the first thing I would say is that it's super weird to uh, to sort of define people's humanity by whether or not they pay taxes and whether they have a right to have opinions. I'm a taxpayer, as a taxpaying citizen, almost always ends with like some sort of weird thing where it's like, I, therefore my opinion is more valid than yours. Like, what? No, everybody's human. And a lot of people don't pay, 
kids don't pay taxes. I mean, let's be honest, white supremacist, like, settler colonialism hates kids too, so that's maybe not a good example. But, you know, seniors, a lot of seniors don't pay taxes, churches don't pay taxes. So why is it always like, Indians don't pay taxes, oh my gosh, like, um, you know, yeah, so there's a very narrow exemption um, in, in the Indian Act, it only applies to status Indians, only applies to goods and services on reserve. Um, even, you know, sometimes the provinces make uh, agreements so point of sale purchases, they'll they'll be like, okay, we don't we don't know if this is being transported to the reserve, so we're just gonna we're just gonna give you the tax exemption. Sometimes they do it, a lot of times they don't. You know, it's 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 been something that's been around for a long time, and you know, every cashier in the history of ever is always like, this is a status card. What do I do with this? You know. So it's and and the idea behind it, when you look at like why that exemption was in there, it was sort of to offset some of the devastating loss of lands and resources that, that uh, status Indians, um, you know, facing. Uh, and it certainly has not done that. Uh, it, like, this is not enriching people. It's a, it's a small thing, and folks hold on to it, cause, because, by God, why should you have to pay taxes to the people who stole your land? <laughs> like, really? Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's important to always push back against that weird tax, like, coming from Alberta, it is, it should be like our province's motto. As a taxpayer, you know, like, Alberta's gotta be up their butt about, like, oh, we, you know, all of our money goes to the east, you know, and nobody really understands, apparently, how any of this works, and so they just make it up as they go along. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter if somebody pays taxes or not, because everybody should have an opinion about things that affect their life, so. It's a weird thing. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much for being here. I feel like I've waited years to meet you. <laughs> uh, well, I have. Uh, and uh, my question is not so much about the book, but about you, your experience of having all these degrees and still being in university, yet, you know, I follow you on Twitter, so I know that. It's not always a great experience, and you've said that today. But so, as someone who's finishing her first uh, her first undergrad degree, but wanting to go into masters, or for anyone else finding themselves in that situation, what advice would you give for us who, like you, struggle in these places yeah. but want to keep going? Oh, protect your spirit. <laughs> That's a big one, um, and you do that uh, in in a great part by just remembering you know, what sustains you is your relationships with other people and your relationships with the land around you. So um, there, I think, I think you, you have to really constantly remind yourself why you're doing this, why you're, putting, why you're punishing yourself, because a lot of it does feel like punishment. And that's, and that's true, I think, of a, a lot of people who these institutions are not built for, which is like most people are, right? Um, they can be sites of incredible violence. Again, you have to put up with the abuse because that's how the real world works. Well, let's make a new real world. But um, I guess some of the things that I've done to keep going, uh, like I do, I'm like, okay, I'm doing this for my family. Yeah. I'm doing this so that, uh, you know, when, uh, I mean, I, I, the education degree was obvious for me. Uh, law, when I went into law, I was like, I had this belief that I was just gonna like force everybody to change, because I would know the law, and it would be like some sort of like magical spell, like Hocus Pocus, Canada's gone. It doesn't work that way. But. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, you gotta you gotta have friendships. You gotta go out. You gotta like drink tea and complain and decompress and find something that sustains you outside of the institution. So whatever that is, some hobby, some some joy, some love that that makes you um, feel like a human being again. Um, you know, it's easy. We talk about self care often uh, in as though it's really, really important that you continue to produce for capitalism. Like self-care is all about making sure that you can still like do that work. Um, sometimes you can't do the work. Sometimes you need to just like take the time. Um, and the elder, I, this was really meaningful to me, that, that idea that like not everything happens when it's supposed to. Like, you know, in the time that you think it will. Um, but it does happen when it's supposed to. And if it takes longer to do things because you are keeping that kernel of you that's, that's still joyful, um, and kind and reciprocal, uh, take the time. Take the time because these places can change you and they can harm you. Um, so, you know, it's not like you can put on a suit of armor. You, you gotta almost become more kind and more loving and more loving of yourself. Yes. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about, uh, like, 
guidance sort of for settlers who are thinking about supporting indigenous struggles and uh, separating for like, you know, in the book you talk about many tools and the First Nations property ownership idea. So like as a settler it's you have to be careful to not just sort of be like, oh I support this and I don't support that and not reproducing like colonial concepts with that. But like also that concept for the, the property ownership thing seems like bad news, you know? Like mm -hmm. but it's like how do I know what like I can't trust my own upbringing, you know, so like it's sort of a puzzle of like what do I support and what don't I support as an outsider? Right. Okay, so the question is basically as as a settler um, how do you support indigenous peoples when there's a diversity of opinions about how we go about doing things, right? It, it, that can be very confusing because you, you, you have the best of intentions. You're like, okay, I understand that, like, first of all, uh, you need to believe people when they tell you what their experiences are. You need to believe that people know what's best for them and have solutions, and you need to support them when they ask you for help. Okay, those are, those are three things that should guide you with your relationships with any community, right? But then, what happens if Folks don't agree. And shockingly, indigenous peoples are not, you know, a homogenous group that all agree. I know, it's weird. <laughs> if you ever go to a Métis meeting, <laughs> you will know that we don't know. <laughs> so yeah, you, you, at some point you really do have to think about, okay, what are, what are your values? And, and, and this constant, you know, there's this constant thing, well, okay, my values are, um, are sort of colored by colonialism and I can't, none of us are decolonized, none, none of us exist outside of colonial structures. We're all making decisions that are based on sort of the, the constraints that we're within. That's, that's, that's true, no matter who we are. And so you're trying to be um, a person who's supportive of, of these struggles, but you see uh, folks saying, we want this, and other folks saying, we don't want this, this is bad. And so who do you choose, right? Who's the good Indian? Who's the bad Indian? And that's like one of the one of the hugest problems that we have with a lot of um, people who, who call themselves allies is they're they're pointing their little finger at the good Indian all the time, like they get to choose. Um, and the fact is is that that's that's not how it works. And there's no simple answers to this. So one of the things that I I think uh, that I do for myself when I'm trying to support communities that are not mine is I think about what are what are my what are my foundational principles? What do I believe most in? Um, I believe most in that the fact that everybody is deserving of their humanity. Everybody's human. That should, that should be obvious. But for some reason, this is something that gets um, put to the side a lot. We're so good at dehumanizing other people and saying they don't deserve um, literally even like the, the necessities of life because they have failed us in some way. So they're they're not good enough because of this, this, or that. You have, for me, that's that's ridiculous. Everybody, even people I really don't like. <laughs> like, there's no exceptions there. Even people I really don't like are human beings. Um, I want I want us all to be able to live together safely. I want people to be able to um, have those nece no, those necessities of life. I'm willing to live with less um, so that everybody can have more. Um, and so when, when I see that there's conflict in a community and I don't really know what to do, I try to offer just the most... Um, useful help as I can, and sometimes it's just literally just washing the dishes for folks while they argue amongst one another about what's the best path, right? Because I think all of us as human beings have similar aspirations. We all, we all want to just be okay, and we want to be loved, and we want to be able to do things that we enjoy. We want to be able to have the space that we need to be the people we want to be. We all want that. We all have different ideas about how to do it, and if those ideas involve marginalizing and dehumanizing others, then I think it's safe to say you don't have to support those ideas. But it's not always easy to see when that happens. So um, sometimes you'll, you'll mess up. Actually, often you'll mess up. Frequently, all the time, we all mess up. Um, and, and, and you're like, but I'm trying to help. But don't let that stop you. Uh, just listen to folks when they're, when they're telling you how you messed up and, and how you can do better. And just realize that like being human is a verb. It's, it's, it's something that's ongoing. We're doing it constantly. And we don't always do it well, but we can get better with practice. So um, yeah, just don't ever, don't ever give up. And you are a lovely person. I'm not gonna tell everybody all the wonderful things that you have done, but, uh, but this is a lovely person. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Continuing to talk about 
indigenous Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, if I could talk about um, solidarity between Indigenous uh, folks and, and, and Black people, many of whom are also Indigenous, so there's mm -hmm. that it's not a strict category. So this is, this is again, talking about screwing up. Um, you know, this is new to me. Honestly, uh, so I, I, I grew up in Alberta, and in, in, in rural Alberta, um, there's like, it's cowboys and Indians. There's no, nobody else, right? Um, and I didn't know that there were actually black communities in Alberta, you know, that, that predate a lot of white communities. I didn't know that. I never learned about that. Um, you know, my dad made this offhand comment once about how there was this, uh, this uh, baseball team in Amber Valley who used to just whip the white boys all the time. And so they stopped inviting them to, to the, the regional playoffs. They were like, well, we're getting our butts kicked all the time, so we're not going to play them anymore. I was like, what? Like, where was this? You know, this, so... Um, I started to realize there's like this this long history here of black presence in <coughs> Canada that nobody ever talks about, and nobody learns about, um, as with many other communities, right? There are all the, as as you uncover your own history that's been deliberately hidden, you start to realize how many histories have been deliberately hidden. Um, you know what what were the relationships like between indigenous and black communities? Like those were relationships that that did form. Just as there are some very interesting relationships between indigenous and Chinese communities. Um, in Vancouver and, and, and beyond, in the interior as well. You know, there are, there are these connections, these kinships that were made, and what happened? Like, it's just like, it's like a wave passed over them and erased all the traces. But you can't actually do that, you can't erase that. It's still there, you just gotta figure it out. And so, a lot of my thinking about this has been like, wow, you know, there is so much more truth out there than I ever imagined. Um, and what does it mean that we're constantly always framing things as like uh, indigenous and white people. Um, you know, it's, it's always, we're always focused on, on white settlers as though that's all that exists. But what about all the other communities that exist out there? How come, how come we don't know each other very well? How come we don't know our issues very well? Like, you know, how many black people know about indigenous issues? How many indigenous people know about black issues? Are we, are we talking to each other? Are we theorizing? Are we spending all this time with this hyper focus looking at the state, right? I was like, whoa, that's the trap. And it is, I mean, it's deliberate, divine conquer, right? And, and that's the thing, once you start looking at the history, you're like, they literally were like pitting us against each other so that we wouldn't link up, and then you're like, ha! It's like, it's like tiger cats, just everybody link up. Um, so, <laughs> so I think, I think you know, over, over time, I've, and I too, I, I got into the trap of always speaking to the state, always speaking to whiteness, always resisting that. And I thought, what would it be like instead sort of like refuse that and start building with black communities and you know um, newcomers who are also here because of global colonialism like what would, what would that look like um, and I'm finding that it's challenging we've done so much harm to each other because white supremacy is all about sort of ensuring that everybody's harming everybody um, and only a certain number of people profit <coughs> it is humbling you know, the more I learn, the more I realize I'm so ignorant and just new to so many of these things. Um, but it's also the most rewarding because this is how we're going to do it. And I talk about smashing the state and decolonization and everything. And really, the people who are not the beneficiaries of white supremacist settler colonialism, I mean, we might get little trickle down, we might get the little, you know, a, a, a little uh, tidbit here and there, but it's not for us. We need to work together to undo that harm. Like, that's, that's how we thrive, that's how we survive. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just think that uh, once you start to see the links between, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, um, settlement, white supremacy, genocide of indigenous peoples, dispossession, you start to see that these structures are all linked and needed each other for what exists now to, to be here. Um, and if we're gonna undo that knot, we have to we have to do it together. There's a Facebook question. Oh, great. It says, um, "What have you found uh, about Indigenous people who have been affected by negative police actions?" Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, what have I found? <laughs> How many hours do you have? I mean, <laughs> I'll stay all day. Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is a thing. Like, I mean, what what did police start as here? Like, they're they're a militarized force to like push Métis, Cree, you know, all of our allies out. Like, that it, like policing presence is is so 
inherently violent. Um, what's, what has been interesting, actually, to me, looking at, you know, when I put to, together presentations and, and whatnot, and I look at uh, stats about incarceration rates um, and things like that, I was, I was like, wow, before the 60s, incarceration rates for Indigenous peoples was like hardly, it was not a thing. It was a, it was a tiny, tiny percentage. And really, like, the past 10 years has been an explosion, particularly for Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And nobody's really talking about that. It's sort of assumed that we were always criminal and always being incarcerated. And it's, it's actually like it's a new thing. You know, it's a, it's, it's a new thing. Um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to really, like, I see you, so I'll, okay, yeah. Um, you, you have to start learning about history. Like, look at, look at the Reagan years and the militarization of police in, in the States. How did that impact uh, police forces here? I mean, it's all... It's all connected. You know, I sound like that you know, guy who said for the board. Yeah. Uh, but it really is. You really got to learn that history and start to realize things have not always been this way. Um, things are actually getting worse. Uh, that, that sort of that violence against black and brown bodies uh, is becoming more pronounced and, and, you know, than it ever was. So what are we going to do about it? Right? And I think that there's been community initiatives. I think that there is so much amazing work, and a lot of this work is led by black thinkers on abolitionism, stuff I, I am not at all qualified to talk about because I'm just just touching the edges of it, and, and these ideas about um, abolishing the police and, and, uh, and taking care of one another really is that relational uh, thing that I'm talking about that fits in so well with, with the indigenous um, you know, uh, belief systems. So... I just, I just, I try to remind myself that, you know, as, as humans, we, we are, we are bounded, um, and, and sort of like bound and, and trapped by our own lifetimes, our own lifespans, and so it's really easy to look at the now and think it's always existed. Even if you tell yourself, it, it hasn't always been this way. It feels like it's always been this way, because it has always been this way for you, for us. And we really, really have to take that long view and think about how it was and how it could be. Um, and we have, to, we have to do the work that we know we're not going to see the fruits of in our lifetime. And we have to be willing to look beyond ourselves. Um, you know, th this is a bit of a rambling thing, but this is really, as I get older and I know that the work I'm doing, I'm not going to see the end of. You know, I'm trying to lay as many seeds out there and be as clear as I can um, in the hopes that our descendants will pick it up and, and be better, right? And, and that's, I think, all we can do. And you can't do that if you uh, deliberately forget what has happened and you don't pay attention to what's happening now. We have to just be always vigilant and paying attention to what's going on. So just to speak to that for a little bit, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but two days ago here on campus, a uh, young native girl, visibly indigenous, of course I think that's important to know, uh, she was maybe 12 or 13, just cuffed and here on campus by two of our own security guards, both white men. Uh, and more or less between 30 minutes, because I wouldn't leave them. I didn't know who it was and why I was leave them. Uh, there were about 10 security that showed up, including two police officers, for one young girl, and they said she needed medical treatment. And I asked them, well, are we taking her to a nurse? And they said, no, there's no other nurse. nurse is on the side and I was like, that's a lie. And uh, I said, have you called a medic or an ambulance? And they said, yes, but the police have to come first to assess the situation. That never would have happened if she were white. Yeah. or you know, a student or a professor or in better clothing or something like that. Uh, she was young and she was traumatized and I think she lost it by accident and they totally blew it out of proportion and you know, she wasn't responding well especially to these guys. And it was just a whole situation. Yeah. And I had to watch her get cut right in front of me. And as a non-citizen, there was only so much I could do or intervene before I could maybe, that could, could lead to something that would have to be coordinated for my own homeland. Yeah. My own so it's like, it was just that conversation that we had here at UMF about white supremacy on this campus because, and about white supremacy in all of these buildings, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in the bureaucracy and the system, it's just it's absolutely everywhere. It's escaping. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you all heard, but it's just recounting a story of a, of a young, visibly indigenous girl, probably about 12, who was, uh, who was cuffed and just had like an overwhelming um, carceral response. Uh, and you know, and, and you're not going to respond well to a situation like like I, this idea that we need to be passive. And so um, I, I have a particular issue with uh, with Alberta, Edmonton specifically uh, has uh, what's called like a they're like resource service officers. They're cops in all of our schools now, and this is something that sort of um, 
is fairly new since the, the late 90s sort of began expanding. So now we have we have police officers and, and they're trying to get into like all the elementary schools. They're in all the high schools, you know, junior highs, but they're, you know, they're there. They do things like put out bait phones, waiting for uh, a kid to steal it so that they can arrest them. Um, you know, often issues that should be administrative dealt dealt with by administration get, get uh, sort of shunted over to the this resource uh, police officer. And so the evidence is overwhelming that, uh, you know, black, brown, you know, visibly indigenous peoples are uh, being targeted and, and being, you know, um, being treated in these carceral manners already in school. And, and this leads, you know, it's the school to prison pipeline. We've seen it in the States. We always talk about the U.S. like it's the worst place on earth. And Canada isn't like that at all. Well, let me tell you, after studying law, Canada lays down and loves authority so much more than the States does. Like the states has actually some pretty intense uh, constitutional um, rights that are absolute. Whereas in Canada, we're like, illegal search, beating up a suspect, as long as the evidence is good, it's all fine. We really love authority here. Um, and so folks have to stop thinking that it's worse somewhere else or it's only bad over there because this stuff happens here. And what, what, what's gonna happen, folks are gonna be like, well, was she resisting? Was she polite? You know, what was she doing? Ooh, is she on drugs? Does she steal? What's her, like, how is she at school? What are her grades like? What did she do? Uh, what did she dress up as uh, for Halloween? Um, you know, like, like all of a sudden it becomes all about the person. And again, it's that hyper-individualization where it's like, this isn't a systemic problem. This is, this was a few bad apples or this was, this person deserved it. You know, like, damn, we got to start questioning authority more. Like, why do we teach our kids to love cops so much? Seriously. Um, you know, that thing where my kid was like, I'm going to be a cop, like that was, that was some serious pushback because I, I was talking about this, you know, here I am, I've had some just horrific experiences with, with police, so, so my family, I know about this stuff and I talk to my kids about it, I'm like, be careful, they have witnessed police brutality, um, they've seen, you know, uh, we, we lived in Montreal, we were like walking from their elementary school when cops like went onto McGill campus and started beating up protesters, um, you know, and they started grabbing kids that they thought looked old enough to be university students and harassing them. Um, you know, Inuit over by Atwater uh, in in uh, in Montreal are constantly harassed by the cops. Like they'll have like five huge guys over one Inuk woman, you know, just and they so they've seen this, and yet I you know and yet I have to constantly talk to them about like don't trust the cop. You know, you have this interpersonal problem at school. Don't go to the cop about it. Don't tell. Don't snitch. You know, <laughs> damn. Like, go to the go to the administration. Go to your teacher. Those are the people that are supposed to do it. So here I am, and 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 they disbelieve their own experiences, um, and and everything that I've told them because that propaganda is so intense. You know, and it doesn't keep us safe. Like every black indigenous and person of color has that talk at some point with their kids. Who's like, don't talk to the cops. Like, be careful and be really like, make sure your hands are here and stuff like that, right? Um, <laughs> white people aren't having those talks with their kids, right? So they, it's like, just because you don't experience it doesn't mean it's not happening. Man, I don't know. I, I really, like, we, these systems of violence, like, we have to get rid of them because it, it just gets more and more intense. Like, every time, you know, like, every time indigenous peoples bang a drum, all of a sudden it's like, oh! You know, the cops are there to keep people safe, but, you know, it's like, uh, at some point we're not going to be able to do anything safely, because people are letting, you know, these folks talk about taxes. These guys get so much of my oh man, I could go on forever. And it doesn't matter if you're a good person, you're not changing the system. And look at, like, even, you know, people are like, well... If there's more indigenous police officers, it's gonna get better. Man, don't they, they, they just have to put up with the systemic abuse too. Like, they have to just go through everything in the hopes that they're gonna help their own people. Like, there's a, there's a high school, an indigenous high school in inner city uh, Edmonton that have the police over all the time so that they get to know the faces of the students so maybe they won't shoot them. You know, like, you gotta, you gotta humanize your kids like that so that, you know, police will be like, oh right, you're human. I met you, I played basketball with you. That's such bullshit. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Last question? Here. 
Yeah, so the, what are my views on the gaps in the healthcare system? Uh, I mean, it's abysmal, and it's, and it's like, also has a long history, right? Um, so some of, the, some of the truths that are coming out right now are about Indian hospitals. Um, these are things that people need to know about experimentation on indigenous peoples and things like that. So there's a long history of, of, of racism in healthcare um, and in access to healthcare. Um, and what do I think about it? I think it's, we, we actually have a lot of information about it. There's been a lot of research done. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of recommendations made over the years by various uh, commissions and inquiries. Um, why, why are we still having this, any of these conversations, right? Like, because we know what the problems are. We know that systemic racism actually is a factor in, in uh, health outcomes for a lot of people, not just Indigenous folks. Um, we've had so many people say, here's how we can change it, and nothing gets done. And that's the thing, like, the, Canada does the research. Canada gets really good people to go out and do that research um, and publish and make recommendations, um, you know, and, and just like, just shelves it and doesn't do anything. Why are we, why are we doing that work? That work is not enough. It's kind of like they pat themselves on the back every time there's a new inquiry. And they're like, okay, now we've got the information. Bully for us. Like, no, you've got to actually do stuff, right? Like um, the Negan Burnside uh, uh, report from 2011 on drinking water and wastewater man management on First Nations they went in and did a comprehensive review, said exactly how much it was going to cost to make sure everybody had access to potable water and good waste management systems, and nothing got done. Like, we have the solutions, and that's what I want people to keep hammering to each other, because everybody talks about us like we're helpless. Like, you know, you just complain, but like, what are we supposed to do? Give us the ideas. Um, go to that dusty shelf and go find a report on whatever it is that you want to know about and start petitioning and agitating and demanding that those changes be implemented because we know what we have to do. Yeah, we literally know what we have to do. <laughs> That's it. Nikita has a gift she's going to give Chelsea later this afternoon. So I won't be doing that piece, but it is going to happen, don't you worry. So thank you so much for attending the first meeting of Unsettling Ideas. If you'd like a copy of Indigenous Rights, please check in the remaining copies of the Indigenous Bookstore, but it's also available very widely, so please go get a copy now that you're inspired if you didn't get a chance yet. Uh, watch for the next assigned reading for the meeting. It will be later in February, so I hope to see all of you here and all of your friends uh, in February for the, the second installment. Indigenous engagement would like to thank all of you for joining us and Chelsea Fowle uh, for leading an unsettling but necessary conversation here at the uh, Magazine Academic. I would like to invite all of your faces to be seen next week at three different events. So we have on Monday, we have our Métis Awareness Mondays where we'll be talking about climate change in the MMF here in this space from 11.30 to 12.30 with Stephen Howitt from Natural Resources at MMF and talking about what can we do on the ground right here, right now, here in Manitoba. On Tuesday, we have our fireside chat, again, right here, so you know how to get here at 11.30 to 12.30. It's going to be with Lauren Olson, talking about Indigenous film and the uh, Indigenous film industry. And then we have the colloquium, which isn't here, but you can still find it. It's at tier, the tier building on Wednesdays. We're going to have Ken, very last, hard last name, uh, for, uh, our Cree speaker here, our Cree teacher. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and he's going to be talking about Indigenous languages and the importance. So next week, don't let your learning stop right here because there is something on this campus every single day that has to do with Indigenous knowledges. So thank you again, Chelsea, and thank you all for coming.